How's it going? Hi, Nathan. How are you? Good. Where is everybody? Good afternoon, all. Hi, how are you? I think if we have a good, uh, you can start. With, yeah, because my connection is poor today. Okay. Just one second. All right, uh, so welcome back everyone. Um, today we're going to discuss uh, tree-based methods and particularly we're going to look at uh, decision trees, bagging, boosting, random forest, and Bayesian additive regressive regression trees. So in the tree-based methods, uh, the main idea is to take the predictor space and then segment it to uh to to first create segments of a predictor space and then within a single segment we take a mean of the uh, of all the response values for regression and uh, the most frequent class in case of classification and then there are different ways how uh, these predictions are combined in these different algorithms that we are going to discuss So here's an example of regression trees. Um, this is the baseball salary data. And on x-axis, we see years. On y-axis, the hits. Um, and we see uh, the created decision tree out of this data, where two uh, main variables or predictors are used, years, uh, and hits, the number of hits uh, of each player. And we see that if the number of years a player is in the sport is less than 4.5, then their mean salary or the salary predicted by the decision tree would be 5.1. And similarly, if it is uh, more than 4.5 years, then it depends further on hits. Uh, if the hits are less than this particular value, then uh, the salary is less. If there are more hits by a player, then the salary also is higher. So this is the main idea of splitting a predictor space and then getting the mean values to predict. Um, now, some terminology of uh, uh, of the decision tree. They, these are internal nodes as highlighted here. And then there are also terminal nodes uh, after which we do not split further. And uh, terminal nodes are also called as leaves. Uh, an example of uh, splitting the predictor space is shown here with years and hits, uh, only these two predictors. And we see three different regions, R1, R2, and R3, which are again based on what we discussed before. Uh, within R1, the prediction is 5.1, which is the mean of all the responses of salary uh, uh, of all these values. The same applies to R2 and R3. Uh, and then how do we interpret this? Uh, I think we already discussed this uh, for years uh, and hits. These are the two variables that were used. And we know uh, on the left uh, branch, this is when this is true. Years is less than 4.5 on the right branch. 
it, this is when it, it is not true. Um, and th the same applies if it is a classification tree. Any questions so far? Okay, so here's uh, the tree building process. We first take uh, all the predictor space and then divide it into x1, x2, up to xp, uh, sorry, r1, r2, until rj uh, regions, uh, where we have all the values of uh, x. And these regions should be non-overlapping. So theoretically, you can create any shape of the region, but uh, in decision tree algorithms, uh, they generally use boxes. The main goal while you are doing the split is to reduce the residual sum of squares. So in this uh, equation, we have y hat rj for a given region rj, we have the predicted value y hat, and we are uh, comparing the, uh, the predicted value with the observed value yi. And so the sum of all of these uh, residual uh, residuals uh, it needs to be as low as possible. Uh, so we want to minimize this at each split of the tree. Um, I want to show one example I found online, which is a very neat way to look at the uh, decision trees interactively. I'm not sure how can I uh, remove this bar at the top. Uh, I, I know you are not seeing this. This is a zoom bar. Um, because my my tabs are hidden. I know, I know. Um, try just minimizing your your screen, like the uh, your browser, browser, and then okay. yeah, there oh, yeah, you that's go. a good idea. Thank you. Um, Let me put this in the chat also. So this shows all the terminology of the decision trees. The example that they provide here is for classification. But I think this is a very nice example to interactively see how the predictor space is divided into different regions. Right, so, so for um, regression trees, the, uh, the way we make a split is by choosing a, a given predictor and the value of that predictor uh, that would minimize the residual sum of squares in both branches. And this is obtained by doing recursive binary splitting. So there are other ways you can do uh, this. Yeah. One question I had on the previous section. Yeah. Maybe I'm just reading into, into this too much. It says that regions can have any shape, but they have to be some sort of rectangle, right? It can't be circles or triangles. With, with the, uh, I think with the recursive uh, binary splitting, uh, it has to be uh, rectangles or boxes. Uh, but theoretically, this could be anything. So uh, the example that we saw before, uh, this one. So this is where we are making those boxes. But mm -hmm. you can you can split it in any way you want. Uh, if you, for example, diagonally split it, then there are no longer boxes. Uh, so right. we have triangles. So we can do that theoretically, but uh, I'm not sure if there are algorithms that do that. Uh, with the decision tree algorithm that we are looking at, they only do this. 
Okay, so if it's if we're using the, the, the out of the box function, it'll do boxes. Yeah. But if you wanted to customize it, you could in theory. I think that there, yeah, there must be uh, someone who has done that, uh, but I don't know how efficient that would be. Right. With recursive binary splitting, because it's a top-down approach, uh, it is uh, efficient. Uh, mm -hmm. At each split, we are so we take, for example, here uh, in the hitter data set, and we divide the uh, the year by. 4.5 in that previous example. So how do we know that we should select years or should we start with hits? That's the first question. Uh, if we only have these two predictors, we can choose either one of them. And then within a given predictor, we can also select any value given the range of the, of the variable. So what value to select for the uh, variable and what variable or predictor to start with? Uh, that's our first question. So we, we try both, for example, years and hits in this example. And uh, then we look at the resulting sum of squares. And whichever produces the smallest sum of squares in both branches, that is the predictor that we will select. I was also thinking about what value is selected here, uh, because it could be uh, for a real number uh, or a predictor with real numbers, it could be any value. It could be 4.5, to something also. So I think behind the scenes, the algorithm uses some, some heuristics to select those values. Uh, the book doesn't go into a lot of detail on how this particular value or rule is used. But we know that residual sum of squares is a criteria for regression trees to make a decision on what uh, feature to select at each point uh, of split. So uh, the approach is also greedy uh, in, in recursive binary splitting because at each step of the tree building process, the best split is made at that particular step. Although uh, if we go further ahead, there may be some other feature that could result in a smaller residual sum of square and so we may use that combination, uh, but we don't do that. Uh, we make this done at every step. So uh, here are the steps. We first select the predictor xj in our previous example that was years and the cut point s. So this is the cut point that I was talking about. In that example, it was 4.5. So how to select that? that uh, is not uh, discussed a lot in the book. So that spreading the predictor space into the regions leads to the greatest possible reduction in RSS. The main criteria is RSS. Uh, how is cut point selected? That's not elaborated. Uh, repeat the process looking for the best predictor and the best cut point to spread the data further. Continue. Uh, doing that, again, we predict the response for a given test of observation using the mean of all the training observations in a given region. But if we keep doing that, we can end up with uh, a predictor space where we have actually split to, to every data point. Uh, we can keep doing that. Let's say we start with 100 data points in our training data. And when we keep splitting using the recursive binary splitting, we eventually will get to uh, individual data points. So the mean of that individual data point would be uh, the same value. Uh, the example that was provided in the book uh, uses a certain number of observations that should remain in a given region, like five observations. But theoretically, um, and I think with the default settings of decision tree, uh, algorithm, you will get to split everything. Um, so in that case, we say that tree is too leafy. Uh, so the number of leaf uh, nodes or terminal nodes are equal to the number of data points. So a better strategy is to have a smaller tree with fewer splits, which will reduce the variance. So the main issue of why this overfitting problem is important to think about is that for the training data, the learning is perfect. You learn, you remember 
uh, uh, everything about their training data. So when you predict on the same data, it's going to provide perfect predictions. But for new data set, uh, it won't uh, be perfect. It would make a lot of mistakes because it may have learned the noise in the data set as well. So we want to uh, somehow uh, somehow reduce this problem of overfitting. So there are two ways discussed in the book. One is to prune a given tree. Before we get into that, I think uh, to make this less boring, uh, we should look at the examples uh, that are in the lab uh, as we are going through these sections. So I'm going to load the tree library. And the example in the labs was using Boston data set. So let's take a quick look at the Boston data set. And here, uh, the med v uh, column here is the response. This is the median income, uh, sorry, median uh, house value in Boston. And all of these are predictors. Then we take uh, a random sample of uh, Boston data set to make the training uh, on number of observations. Uh, so here we have, these are all the uh, rows uh, in the data set that we will select as the training data. And then we fit the model using the tree uh, function. So here, uh, MEDV is the response and we are selecting everything else as predictor and we are using the subset argument to say that these are all the training observations. Then we look at the results. With summary function, we see this result that there are only four uh, predictors which were used uh, in the construction of the tree. Now, I'm not sure how the tree uh, function selects these four, because theoretically it should use all of them. Uh, I've also tried uh, the sklearn uh, uh, library and uh, in Python and there it uses all of them unless you provide uh, a particular set of features to use. So in this case, it selects somehow the features uh, in, in use for construction. And uh, we also see the residual mean deviance, which is the sum of squared errors of the tree, which also tells us how uh, good is the fitness of the model. We can plot this tree, which is one of the strengths of uh, decision trees. So if we take a look here, we see, um, so we see here that RM uh, feature is, uh, is the first feature that is used to make the split. And then LSTAT and RM is repeated here again. So RM is the number of rooms uh, in and every number of rooms in a house. And LSTAT is the number of uh, low income, uh, uh, the, and the percentage of low income uh, people in, in that area. What we are predicting here is MEDV, which is the median house uh, value. So we see that this is the resulting prediction, uh, sorry, resulting decision tree, uh, a regression tree. And we can make predictions using this fitted tree. So we provide tree.boston to the predict, uh, uh, predict function, and we tell it that it's uh, coming from the uh, that the data it should make predictions on should be the test data. So these are the predictions by hat. And now we can uh, plot the predictions versus the actual values. So this shows us uh, how we performed visually. And we see that uh, we, we are generally uh, not uh, too wrong, so we generally the pattern is matched. And here is the mean squared error. The mean squared error is here is thirty five. Uh, if you run this again uh, with a different seed, you'll get slightly different value. 
And on average, we see that about $5,940 is a difference between what we predict and what are the actual values of the uh, median home value. So this was a regression tree. Uh, there's also a classification tree example using the car seats data. So let's take a look at car seats data. Uh, here we have the response, which is sales. Uh, but since sales is pneumatic, uh, in the example, they change it to a uh, binary variable using uh, the condition that if sales is less than eight, then we provide, uh, you say no, otherwise yes. So now we have uh, the high feature in our data set. Uh, look at it again. So high feature contains yes and no based on sales. So we want to predict that these values based on the predictors excluding sales. So uh, again, in the tree function, we provide the uh, the response and predictors. We remove the sales from predictors and we're doing that for the car seats data. And here are the results. So we see uh, that these are all the features that the tree function uses uh, to build uh, the decision tree. We see that there are 27 terminal nodes or leaves. And we also see the residual mean deviance. So here the meaning of deviance is uh, or the interpretation is that a small deviance indicates a tree that provides a good fit to the training data. So the smaller this value, the better fit we have, but uh, we don't have a range for this. Uh, we can compare uh, from one fit to another fit, what is the difference between them in terms of residual mean deviance. Uh, this classification rate, uh, uh, can also be seen here, and uh, that tells us how many uh, errors the model has made. So we have 9% misclassification error. Let's take a look at the resulting decision tree. So we have uh, this result for the car seats uh, data where shelf location is selected as the first feature to split the data. And uh, we see that if shelf location is bad or medium, then uh, we split to the left branch. If it is good, then we split to the right branch. And then price is used for further splitting. And at each step of it, each split, uh, because this is classification, we compare not uh, the uh, mean squared error but instead a different uh, a different uh, measure, which is either Gini coefficient uh, or Gini index is another name, or entropy. Uh, the book says that you can also use uh, the classification error rate for doing that, but it generally does not provide better results compared to Gini coefficient and uh, the entropy. So we can... Um, take a look at that first. So this is the classification or misclassification error rate. PMK is the proportion of the training observations in a given region that are from a given class. So in our example uh, for car seats data, we have two classes, yes and no. So if we have a class of yes, then we look at the proportion of yeses in a given region and similarly the proportion of noes in a given region and we estimate what is the uh, class the error rate for both of those classes in a given region that uh, will give us the error rate gini index uh, also uses that proportion and this is the formula that it uses uh, a smaller value of Gini index will indicate a higher node purity, which means that uh, if Gini index is smaller, uh, to more closer to zero, then we have a higher number of 
uh, the same class. So in our example, we have yes and no's. So we'll either see more yes or more no. That would indicate a smaller value of Gini index. Similarly, entropy, which is uh, mathematically different from Gini index, but provides uh, similar results. Um, it also uses these proportions of a given class in a given region. And a smaller value of entropy similar to Gini index will also provide a higher node purity. Again, that means that we have a higher number of the same class. So yes is more frequent in a given region and no is more frequent in another region, for example. So uh, because here in car seats data, we are doing classification, uh, the result uh, of, of this decision tree, the split of this decision tree on each branch is based on selecting the minimum uh, uh, GD index or the minimum entropy. Um, so uh, that, is, that was using the, the complete data set. Now in this uh, example further, they take a random sample and then fit the data to that to look at also the result for the test data. So again, uh, the, the code is the same. There's no difference there. But now we can look at uh, how well we did on the test data. So for instance, we have a predicted nodes uh, 104 when uh, the actual nodes were 104 plus 13. So there are 13 errors that the model made here. Similarly, uh, there are uh, 33 errors for the yes class in the test data that the model made. So the number of correctly predicted uh, values are 104 plus 50. Okay. So based on our discussion so far, we know that a decision tree by default has a tendency to fit to all the data. It will overfit. So what we can do is, uh, there are two ways. One is to prune the tree. So we limit it to either a certain number of observations uh, below which it will not split anymore. Uh, one other way that is explained here is using the cost complexity pruning method. So this method uses uh, the, uh, this equation for building sub trees out of uh, the, the original tree. So you have the original tree, which is something that where the decision trees um, algorithm is fit to the complete data set and without any uh, alterations to it, it will just split everything. And then once we get that, uh, the cost complexity pruning is going to build a subtree out of it based on this uh, parameter called alpha. So the notation here is uh, using T as the number of terminal nodes or the number of leaves below which we are not splitting anymore. And RM is the rectangle or the region uh, for uh, corresponding to a given terminal node. And then the prediction that we are making in that region is again the mean in case of regression and or the most frequent value in case of classification. So how do we select the value of alpha? First, if we look at this equation, we see that T is the number of terminal nodes. So if alpha is one, then we get the original tree without any uh, any obstacles or any uh, constraints to the uh, to the uh, decision tree model. But if we increase the value of alpha, then this will uh, not increase from one. If it is higher than zero, uh, then it will reduce uh, the, uh, the number of terminal nodes because it's multiplied with that. So we will see an overall reduction here in the equation. So we need to choose a value of alpha first, and we can choose it using k fold cross-validation. So we repeat these steps, one and two. We first grow a very large tree, 
and then apply the cost complexity pruning, this equation, for each of these number of folds. So we have k as uh, the number of folds. So k minus one divided by kth fraction of training data. We apply that to each of them and then average the results and pick the alpha to minimize the average mean squared error. In terms of code, this is just one line, but uh, conceptually it is uh, something to, uh, something that takes time to understand. Um, so we, we, uh, we first find alpha using uh, k-fold cross-validation. If you look at this same thing in the code, we use this uh, line cv.tree that would take uh, the complete decision tree t naught as indicated here, t naught. And cv means cross-validation. So we do that, let's take a look and we see uh, the size, which is the number of terminal nodes, uh, the dev, which is uh, the number of cross-validation errors. So in a, in a given size tree, how many errors we are making. Then uh, K is the alpha value. Um, and if we take a look at the plot of size versus dev, This is the regression tree. So remember, this is based on the Boston data set. So on x-axis, we see the size of a uh, decision tree. And on y-axis, we are looking at the uh, number of errors that were made. So we see that cross-validation tells us that if we have a tree with seven terminal nodes, then we get to the minimum errors minimum number of errors. So that means we should choose this uh, decision tree with seven terminal nodes. So now if we uh, if we apply this method prune.tree on our original uh, fitted decision tree with best equals to five, that will prune the tree using five terminal nodes. We just saw that seven nodes is what the cross validation is suggesting us. But just for the sake of example, the lab examples show what happens if we use this tree. And now if we take a look here. So five here is the number of terminal nodes. So one, two, three, four, and five. And this is the tree that we'll get. And now we can use this tree to make predictions. But we know that uh, cross validation tells us we should use uh, a decision tree with seven um, with seven uh, terminal nodes. So we'll use that. Uh, we actually have used that when you we are making predictions here. So when you we are making predictions, uh, sorry, in the regression section. So here are the predictions that we made. This is based on the original decision tree, which is using those seven terminal nodes. So this is already in a good shape. And for the classification trees, we will apply the same method, the cv.tree method. And we provide one more argument, which is prune.misclass, so that it knows that we are using the misclassification error rate as our uh, criteria. And now if you take a look at the results here, these are again the number of terminal nodes, and we see the number of errors that uh, the decision tree algorithm is making, and k is again the alpha value. So we see that the fourth value here is 74, which is the smallest number of errors, and that was obtained when the when the value of k 
uh, which is alpha, uh, is 1.4. So we can now use that value to create a prune tree. Before that, we can take a look at it visually. So here again, we have size and the number of errors on y-axis. So when the size is less than 10 here, uh, the nine, uh, nine uh, terminal nodes, we see that we get uh, the smallest error. Similarly, when the alpha is 1.4, then we get the smallest number of errors. Any questions so far? So remember, uh, in our classification example, we had this tree. This is the original tree without any constraints. This is what we get with 27, I think, terminal nodes. And then we use prune.misclass to get a prune tree. And we tell it that we want uh, nine terminal nodes. And now when we take a look at it, now we have nine terminal nodes here. And this is a uh, much more uh, easy to interpret and uh, use decision tree. Also provides better predictions. Any questions? So I'm skipping the, uh, yeah, one point here on this uh, page is that we have, uh, we sometimes have the same prediction, yes and yes, even though we are splitting using a, a feature. So in this example, we have yes and yes. Uh, we, we would intuitively uh, expect a yes and no. So if a value is less than one, then yes, uh, not less than one, but more than one then it should be no. But we see that we get sometimes the same uh, prediction regardless of what branch we are at. And uh, uh, when that happens, uh, why do we make a split? Why the decision tree makes a split at all? That was a question raised here. So the main thing is that it would lead to a better uh, node, which means that a higher purity. And that higher purity uh, means in, the, in this particular example, where uh, on the left branch, there were nine observations and all nine of the observations had a value of yes. On the right branch, there were 11 observations out of which seven were yes and the remaining one no. So this would lead to a higher node purity for the left branch where all nine were yes. So what does that mean? Why is node purity important in this context? So it would be important uh, using this example, if we have a test observation that belongs to a region given by right-hand leaf, which is less pure, then we can be, sorry, which is more pure, then we can be pretty certain that it is, its response is yes, because all of them were yes. In contrast, if a test observation belongs to a region given by the left-hand leaf, then its response value is probably yes, but we are less certain. So this will not reduce the classification error rate or the misclassification error rate, but it will improve the Gini index and the entropy. And these are one of the criteria that is used to uh, make the split by the decision tree. So uh, the advantages of decision tree is that they are easy to explain. You can actually print out your results and show them. I've seen papers that use decision trees uh, figures uh, when they are looking at uh, when the main objective is inference instead of uh, making uh, accurate predictions. So in that context, it's really easy um, and interpretable, but uh, because it would overfit uh, unless you prune it, uh, you don't get good test accuracy compared to other methods, ensemble methods that we are going to discuss now. Uh, they also provide relatively less uh, accuracy even after pruning. 
So one of the ensemble methods uh, that combines multiple decision trees instead of using only one is called as bootstrap aggregation or backing. The bootstrap aggregation uses multiple decision trees. Let's say there are 10 decision trees that it uses. And the reason why it uses multiple uh, decision trees is because if we have n independent observations, which is each is given by z1, z2, and to zn, and each has a variance of sigma squared, then the variance of the mean will be given by sigma squared or n. And then we take an average of those set of observations that would reduce this variance. So this is based on earlier discussion in the book and our uh, meetings where uh, variance and bias was discussed. So uh, our goal is to make predictions using a machine learning or statistical learning model that would not produce a high variance when we predict on one data set compared to another data set. For any given data set, new data set, we should always get generally good results, reliable results. Um, we don't want it to vary a lot between one data set to another. So averaging these observations would lead to reduced variance. That's why bagging is an effective method. In terms of terminology here, uh, B represents uh, bootstrapped training data sets. So what does bootstrapping mean here? Uh, this was previously discussed also, but just to review, bootstrapping means that we have one training data set and instead of uh, going and collecting more training data sets, uh, which is discussed in the next uh, uh, in here, um, we can take the same training data set and then do repeated sampling of the rows of the of the training data, and produce uh, this, uh, the same sized data as the training data. So let's say if we have one hundred observations in our training data, then we take that training data repeatedly sample rows randomly from uh, that training data, but we still sample 100 rows. That would be a new training data, but it is bootstrapped, which means that uh, as the book discusses, there are about one third of the observations uh, which are left out. One third of the observations in the training data which are left out, which are not included in the bootstrapped uh, training set. Uh, so from one bootstrap set to another bootstrap set, we may have different observations that are in each of them. And some of them will be uh, overlapping, some of them won't be overlapping. So we can use that to, uh, to uh, build a decision tree and fit a decision tree to each one of those a bootstrap training data set. And then we have those left out, one third of them left out observations. And we can use that fitted decision tree to make a prediction on those out of bag, so to say, observations, which were not included in that bootstrap training set. So if we have, let's say, only 10 observations in our training set and the bootstrap training set now includes uh, observa observation number one, two, seven. Three observations are not included. We still have 10 number of observations, but some of the observations were repeated, but the unique number of observations in the bootstrap set is one to seven. And that means that we have three observations that were never included in this bootstrap set. And we can make predictions on a fitted decision tree on the bootstrap set on this new new uh, test data or out of back data. Another uh, aspect of uh, using this ensemble learning bagging is where we now uh, we now no longer have access to the interpretability of a decision tree because we are not using just a single decision tree. If we are fitting one hundred decision trees or as we'll see in a moment, 500 decision tree, which is the, which is the default uh, in the tree algorithm, we'll get uh, 500 different decision trees on those 500 different bootstrap training sets. So that means we are no longer able to easily interpret the results. 
So variable importance is another way to uh, make it relatively interpretable and to understand which features are important. And the way it works is that it looks at the residual sum of squares uh, that would be uh, that would be the result if we remove, for example, one of the variables. So in this example, we have all of these features where this tile uh, feature seems to be the most important. So what does this variable importance value mean? If we remove this tile feature from our training set, then the amount of decrease in RSS will be the highest by uh, because of this variable. Because we have removed it, the RSS will decrease, the residual sum of squares. And the reason is because we removed this. So RSS or R squared can also be used, although R squared was not discussed in the book, but RSS can be used for uh, regression and GD index can be used for um, for classification to evaluate the variable importance. There are other ways that people uh, estimate variable importance. Uh, the book doesn't go into a lot of detail, but I found two ways. One is to remove the variable and then see what happens to RSS. Another is to do random permutation, which means that we destroy the actual relationship between the feature and the response, and then fit the model and then see what is the value of RSS or R squared. I think behind the scenes, this is how variable importance uh, algorithm is working. So let's take a look at an example uh, with uh, bagging first. So again, we are using uh, the Boston data set. And in the labs, they use random forest. So I know that in the lab discussed here in the slides, they use tidy models, but I, I did not use them. I just used uh, what was described in the book. So again, there's this uh, nice example of random forest and we'll put that in the chat. This is also based on the same website that I previously shared. Let's create the data set. And now with random forest, function, we are going to fit the random forest model uh, to the Boston data set. Now, it says random forest, but uh, we are not yet at the topic of random forest. We are still doing bootstrap aggregation. So with bagging, uh, we need all variables. So m try in random forest function means the number of features that we want to use, the number of predictors. So for Boston data set, we have 13 columns. So 12 are predictors and one is the uh, response. Uh, again, if you look at it, uh, the Boston data set is, it has MEDV, which is what we are predicting. The remaining 12 are predictors. So uh, you also notice here that importance is equal to true, which will compute the importance is also. So we fit this backing model, and this is the result. By default, it uses 500 decision trees, and we see the mean of square residuals is this much. Now we can make predictions using the predict method on the test data set. And let's look at it. So we see uh, on x-axis, we have the predictions. On y-axis, we have the actual values. So they correspond pretty well in this regression example. And then we take a look at the mean value. So this value is 23.4, which is slightly less than 24, which we obtained from the decision tree in the previous example. So this is a slight improvement on based on pruning the decision tree, and this is based on bagging. We can also change the number of trees here. Uh, instead of using 500 default value, we can use 25, fit the model again, make predictions, 
And now when we take a look at the test mean squared error, now because we are using less number of decision trees, we see a relatively higher value compared to this. And the reason again is because with higher number of decision trees, because we are taking averages of all of those decision trees, uh, we get better results uh, because variance is reduced. But with less trees, uh, it gets relatively worse results. So the main difference between random forests and bagging is the random forest not only uh, looks at, uh, not only uses the bootstrapped samples, but also chooses uh, a certain number of uh, predictors at each split. Remember, in a decision tree, all the predictors are used to make a decision. And then based on RSS or regression trees, it will decide which feature to use to make a split. With random forest, it will use by default uh, the square root of the number of features in our training set. Um, here is one example. Uh, where they have used uh, different numbers. So M equals to P here means that number of features used in the model are equal to the number of predictors in the data. So this is that yellow line, the blue line is with P over two, and then the green is the square root of P and the smallest test classification error was obtained when the square root uh, number of um, predictors were used. Before we discuss boosting, let's take a look at random forest example with Boston data set. So again, um, I'm setting a seed here to make sure that the bootstrapping results have the same result that we see in the book. And with random forest function, we now use not the default number of predictors, uh, but a smaller number of predictors. So we have m tri equals to six. Remember the original one, 12. And we make predictions and then look at the mean squared error. And now the test mean squared error compared to the backing approach is much smaller. So random forest uh, uses both bootstraps, uh, bootstrap samples and chooses uh, from a set or uh, number of features to make uh, a split at a given branch or a node. Uh, importance functions will tell us what is the importance of uh, different features, and we can also plot them. So here we see that the number of rooms, uh, every number of rooms per house and uh, the percentage of low income uh, uh, groups uh, is the highest, are the two highest number of uh, influential uh, predictors in our model. Any questions? Okay. So boosting is another way to use a multi multiple number of decision trees. And uh, in this case, instead of using um, instead of using uh, the trees uh, pa in parallel, uh, it uses them in sequence. So it will first use one, uh, it will first fit one decision tree, and then based on the residuals of this decision tree, it will fit, fit another uh, decision tree. So rather than using the outcome Y, for the second decision tree and so on, it will use the residuals of the previous decision tree. So without going into a lot of detail of the uh, terminology, uh, I'm going to get to the results here. Uh, so here we see uh, two results from boosting, the yellow and the blue, and the random forest is in green. So we can see that both boosting results provide better results uh, in this classification example. Okay, let's do one example of boosting here. So GBM, a gradient boosting machine, is the 
uh, library that we are going to use in the example. Again, we have the Boston data set and we are using GBM function to fit the model. Uh, important to note is distribution equals to Gaussian to indicate that this is a, a regression problem. Uh, the number of trees that I use are significantly uh, higher here, 5,000, and direction depth is how much depth or the which, which will uh, produce the nodes, uh, terminal nodes. So how much depth we want to go to. So that would uh, create this model. And now if we take a look at the results, we see that again, RM and the second one is LSTAT are the two most influential variables in terms of importance. And we can then also look at their partial dependence uh, plots. So this is for RM, where as we see the number of rooms increase per house, we see that the predicted median uh, value of the house also increases, which is an intuitive result. Lastly, we have Bayesian additive regression trees. To be honest, I did not understand how the algorithm works. Uh, still looking at it next week, uh, hopefully I'll have a better understanding. But the main crux that I understood was that it also uh, uses uh, multiple decision trees, but uh, instead of using only uh, boosting or bagging approach, it combines them. So given the time we have left, I'm skipping the discussion about the algorithm here. Um, and let's see. Yeah, let's take a quick look at the example here. So uh, the BART library requires us to have uh, the data in, in the matrix form. That's why uh, this is done here. And now we can fit the model. Uh, for a regression uh, problem, we use gBART function. And we also right away tell it what is the test data set. So this takes a few moments uh, and then we get uh, the results. This is the result of BART fit, and then we are getting Y hat test. And here is the mean prediction. So uh, this is 15.94. If you remember the previous value that we saw with boosting was 20 something. So this is a significant improvement in terms of uh, the test uh, mean squared error. Um, so before we close, uh, does anyone want to talk about the BARD algorithm? Did you understand it well? No, that's pretty fuzzy for me. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? I can't add any more insight either. Yeah. I'll try to uh, take some notes for the next week so that uh, we can discuss that a little bit while doing exercises. Um, any questions? No, nicely done. All right, thank you. Um, so I should stop now. Okay.